British troops have been sent here to Bassus in Canada since 1972 to take part in vital preparation that will prepare them for future deployments. Right now, there are thousands of troops on the Canadian prairie, Challenger 2s and Warriors, as they take part in Exercise Prairie Storm. It's uh, nearly twice the size of uh, the Isle of Wight. It's a very, very large training area, and one that uh, you can lose uh, battle groups uh, inside and they can go about and do their manoeuvres. We're here to train battle groups. We're here to train them against a, a near peer threat, and we're here to do high intensity warfighter training. We've got the space here to do it. We've got the kit here to do it. You know, we deliver the most complex and largest ranges in the British Army. Congress. Victor Alpha 987 It is a 37-day exercise and those at the sharp end know they have to make the most of their training. Then we move off from 0730 tomorrow. Battles for the Queen's Royal Hussars is a culmination of years training and it will take us right to the very peak of readiness. So every soldier here will be as good as he's ever he or she's ever going to be at their job at the end of this training period. So it really should make us absolutely ready to deploy whenever the nation needs us to. Doing battle in a place you've probably never heard of. The training area is known as Atropia, where British soldiers practice their war fighting. fictional place because using the name of a real country might be undiplomatic. In reality, the Queen's Royal Hussars are on the prairies of Suffield in Canada. Yeah, it's a big, big adrenaline rush when you, you know, you've got the sort of got main armour going off, you've got, you look to your left and your right and you can see the entire squadron of tanks uh, firing. It's, it's just a pretty impressive sight. The next three days are probably going to be the only three days of battle group live fire that we as a squadron get to do for the next two or three years. To actually come together, particularly using live ammunition and then particularly against a three thinking enemy is really the only way to properly test uh, you know, me and the battle group and to make sure we can deliver in that sort of uh, context. An elite team of safety staff are overseeing day one of live firing. So far, things are going smoothly. The first combined arms uh, subunit attack, that was brilliant. Uh, guns probably check fired a little bit early, uh, but other than that, it was pretty much uh, bang on. When the beacons are flashing, it means they are weapons state green and can fire at any time. Commander Battus, call sign 9, is out on the ranges. It's day one, we use live fire as a way of building the battle group up, so we don't expect it to be perfect in any way, shape or form on day one. Actually, they're doing pretty well. Live firing is, by its nature, dangerous, and so the safety team can't lose concentration for a second. Yeah, Roger, Radio chatter is strictly monitored, and everyone on the range knows S cubed or stop, stop, stop means absolutely everything has to freeze. The morning has gone well, but during the afternoon, There was a safety call, so we observed from up here uh, a rear vehicle still had his weapon state indicator flashing with a vehicle uh, containing troops in front of him, which is an absolute no-no. I mean, effectively, we had the chain gun still live with ammunition in it, and he was one pull of the trigger away from strafing his own troops. So that's why you have to step in? So that's why we stopped it. Um, but actually, everybody did the right thing, they just did it a bit too late. So, um, but again, that's, that's why we have safety call signs on ranges. We like to do the safety as far away from the battle as possible to give them the freedom that they need, but able to then step in and stop things if it looks dangerous.
The exercise, like a real engagement, is unrelenting. The battle group are tested through the night. Mock villages are secured in the heart of the base. Military dogs sweep the area. Well, now that night has fallen, the Queen's Royal Hussars and the whole of the main battle group are now making their way through this village for the night attack to begin. It's not long before battle commences. Looms light the sky as training is put into practice. But on a 37-day exercise, more challenges and tests lie ahead in the morning. War is no respecter of weather. Preparing for battle in these conditions, not ideal, but enduring whatever the Canadian prairies have to throw at them is par for the course. In a few hours' time, there'll be live firing against the enemy, but during this 37-day exercise, the Queen's Royal Hussars have had to leave their strongest connection to the outside world, locked away and strictly off-limits. It's called going ped red. It means no mobile phones. We don't have any phones on exercise because my view of it is we need to focus on war fighting and what we're training on and I want the teams to come together and talk to each other and engage and make sure they begin to know each other. Um, what it means is we've learned some old arts of letter writing. I am written as much to my family in previous operational tours as I used to when we went on tour when I first joined the army. Um, so we've been sort of relearning some of those old skills. I think most importantly though, Actually, soldiers are really coming together and talking more and engaging more because no one can hide behind their screens like sometimes uh, we can be tempted to do in society. So how's it going down and are they actually turning to pen and paper as directed by their commander? Lieutenant Oliver Plunkett is. He's writing to his girlfriend, Lauren. A long exercise, 37 days with no phones, is, is for some people um, quite a struggle. I think... To begin with, there was a bit of uh, sort of contention with it, but people have accepted that, that that's the, the the directive and that's what we're going with. So um, guys are guys are writing letters home and um, and corresponding that way. And how are you finding it? Uh, yeah, not not too bad. I know that it's easier for me out here. I'm busy. Um, I'm I'm in the same boat as everyone else. So for me, it is not the problem. But I know that you know back home. Uh, Lauren, my girlfriend, all, you know, all, all her girlfriends can speak to their boyfriends whenever they want. So that's um, that's probably the, the difficulty is that I know that she's probably uh, waiting for the for the phone to ring. What I hope is when we come off the prairie and people get their phones back, they realise actually you really can survive without them. That actually is not a bad thing. And funnily enough, not that much has changed, and they haven't missed out on much. So I, I hope, like a lot of things that can be tough, at the end of it, you are more resilient, and that's really half the point. For Lieutenant Plunkett, once the exercise is over, he'll ditch the letter writing and call his girlfriend. Being cut off from loved ones, just one of the many sacrifices endured by those serving and those back in the outside world, wondering how they're getting on. He's decided to deploy the battle group into the field without any electronic devices. So he's gone ped red, or personal electronic device sort of ban. Um, I think that's a really good thing to do. I, I fully support him in that because when they deploy later on this year, um, they're likely to be in an environment where they won't be carrying uh, electronic devices. So he's setting the conditions for that early. Why is that important from a security point of view? Well, it can just be exploited, especially in the grey areas. So we might not be going into, uh, in, in the area that they're likely to go to. It's not a conflict as we've known over the last sort of decade, um, it, but there, there is a lot of um, sensitivity politically and therefore the last thing we want to do is expose ourselves to um, uh, exposure in the, in the multimedia sense uh, and therefore almost um, negate our very reason for being there. What, what does that mean in practice? Are you talking about you know, stopping uh, potential enemies from, from tracking? 
There's a number of things that they can do, but really it, it would probably be more the um, the honey trapping and, 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 and working out ways of sort of uh, monitoring what we're doing, trying to get snippets of information, but also uh, it, it's just uh, swarming the internet with, with basically false stories and things like that. So the less opportunity we provide, uh, the less risk that we're taking. They are the guardians of the Canadian skies over Battus, the British Army Training Unit Suffield. 29 flight are tasked with watching over the thousands of soldiers on the ground below as they do battle and train for their next deployments. Flight Sergeant Major David Alexander is showing me just how vast the training area is and giving me an insight into his job. Bearing in mind that we supply medevac throughout the year uh, when so we might see uh, temperatures from below minus 30 to extreme heat of plus 30. So getting the guys off the ground in them situations, we need to make sure that it's first of all safe for us to fly the helicopter out to them and then get them as swiftly as we can off the ground. 29 flight are on call 24 hours a day to respond to any medical emergencies in their fleet of gazelle helicopters, watching out for any issues or problems that personnel might be having on the Canadian prairie as they exercise on the ground below. During the exercise period in 2019, they've flown eight medivac casualties direct to Calgary. By the end of the exercise, they will have covered 2,856 hours of medivac standby. The dangers of the training here are real. More than 40 crosses, a sombre reminder of deaths during training over the last few decades since the army arrived here in 1972. We can get those uh, casual, a possible casualty off the area both day or night, uh, launching within 30 minutes of being given the call and, and arrive on the helicopter landing site on top of the hospital uh, within 10 minutes of getting that uh, casualty onto the aircraft. And indeed, we can get uh, the doctor, we can give uh, vital patient care on the way to that hospital. Uh, I think it's important that they know that we're here for them so they can make their train as realistic as possible and we can keep it as safe as possible for them. As we fly, we spot a vehicle stuck in the bog. It's a common problem with this sort of terrain. As you've already seen today, we have uh, vehicles that get bogged in. There's potential for night move for vehicles to move. Uh, move. Um, we've really got to look out for the guys and make sure that they're confident to do their training and make sure that they know that we're here for them should the worst happen. Back on the ground and 29 flight work around the clock to provide a range of duties for Battus. We're a very small unit, uh, as an Army Air Corps unit, uh, detached um, uh, in Canada, supporting uh, what is quite a big operation over here to sort of train up the, the troops. And uh, we spend a lot of our time flying solo pilot around the prairie uh, within red templates with guns firing. So uh, as a pilot, it can be quite a, a challenging and interesting job by day and night. Victor Tango 4612. We also provide uh, safety in the form of red top, so we'll hover over the tanks, uh, make sure that they remain safe throughout their lines of manoeuvre. And then uh, on top of that, we also provide sort of uh, liaison flying, um, ferrying people around the prairie and also acting as enemy and friendly forces. For this exercise, American Blackhawks are lending their expertise. They've flown in briefly from Montana. One of the advantages of this base is the unrestricted airspace. There's no aircraft allowed over the top of this area, so it means we can do real-time airspace deconfliction with fires and movement of aircraft. And we've got some American aircraft supporting us on this exercise. We've got our own aircraft. We've got UAS flying. We've got, we've got the full gambit flowing. And so it does mean that we can practice and train at real-time pace without any interference or need to go to civil aviation authorities for clearance. Without 29 Flight, the dangers of this vast training area would pose huge problems for those exercising on the ground below. They hope they won't need to be called, but when emergencies do happen, that's when they are relied upon the most.
Within the British Army's biggest training area, there's always a real range of things happening at any one time. Each day brings with it new challenges, and today, an unexpected test is waiting for this convoy. Hello. Just how will they react? Uh, did you end up pulling out the vehicle, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Just stay laid down for yeah, just, lay down. just stay laid down. It's certainly got the attention of the locals. So in this scenario, we've set up an injury on the side of the road where someone's fallen off a truck and broken a leg and got a head injury. So as you can see behind me, uh, we have uh, one of our OMs as well, who's playing as, who's an actor by trade initially and then joined the army. He is, um, is acting as a casualty here. The former actor is Captain Tim Harcourt, and he's using all his training to make his injuries seem as real as possible. Hey, Liam, come over here and you can call me if you want. Okay. She's doing really well, doing really, really well. I was impressed. What was really good about this scenario was she uh, assessed the situation, jumped out, was there relatively quickly after the first soldier, um, and they were sure they were protected. And with that, it's time to get back on the move. Elsewhere, and craftsman Jack Davis is facing a challenge. Our problem today is our gearbox, so which is a transmission. Uh, we're not getting any drive out of it, so our gears are not selecting. So it's either engine side not getting into our gearbox, or our gearbox itself is just not telling it what to do. If it's bigger than, say, like an engine or something, we probably won't have the lifting equipment to do it in the field, so it'll get sent back to our battalion. We're 18 days in, it's, been, uh, it's already been quite a long period for them, you know, out on the area. The weather has been uh, variable, so when we first deployed they had snow, we've had sun. As you can see today, it's pretty windy. All of the training that they're doing here is, is, is vital. What goes through your mind when you get a vehicle and you're like, what have you done to this? <laughs> so, yeah, so, sometimes we get vehicles and they come in and they're, they're in some sort of state. We're looking at how the hell have you done that? But more or less we know of how they've done it. Some drivers are just reoccurring all the time. We know how it's done. So sometimes they're quick fixes. Uh, some things that are bigger, we do think, how have you managed that? And yeah, we'll just, we'll just crack on and try and fault find our way through. And whilst all of that is happening, dozens of chefs are working around the clock to feed the staff who work on base and those who are helping monitor the exercise. It's their busiest time of year. In full flow, uh, we feed about 1,800 people when the battle group's in. Uh, when the rip happens, so when the, the next battle group comes in, uh, that figure can go up to about 2,600. We do get a lot of early meals coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I don't think people generally know what we do behind the scenes, so when they've just come through, there's always food on the hot plate for them. Uh, no matter where the British chef goes in the world, there is always food on the hot plate. They will get busier when the battle group finishes the exercise and switches from rations. Then they too can appreciate the fruits of these chefs' labours. My name is Ethan. I like Canada because I love frozen school. <laughs> Thousands of miles from home, welfare for the families of those based at Battus is key. Edward was born here, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Edward is Canadian and Ethan was born in Germany. Here is, is amazing. I like it, I like it. And the support is, is really nice since day one when we arrive. That support stretches beyond playgroups. Well, fair, it is significant, but, it, but you need to remember as well that it's, it's not just the welfare as in agencies like uh, myself or, or the other support agencies. I mean, the chain of command uh, looks after soldiers as well, so that's, that's where welfare starts. And it is vital because if you've got happy soldiers and happy families, uh, they will be able to perform uh, a lot better. Uh, they'll be more operationally effective. It's great for retention, and in some instances, it's uh, it's it's good for uh, recruitment. So, so welfare is a, is a crucial part to to the offer which we which we give all the soldiers and families. What are the challenges of of being a military wife? Most of the time, you're alone uh, when your husband goes for an exercise. Everybody is in the same boat. So, um, I like these kind of groups because you can <coughs> meet very nice people. 
and just reopen um, about that, about the military. It can be hard, but it's, it's, it's very nice to travel around. It's about uh, things like living with Canadian weather and coping with different baby milks and different foods here. Isolation is a big issue here, especially in winter. If we have a hard winter and it's below minus 20 degrees, people sit in their houses and get cabin fever. So that's one reason why the baby clinic is open. It's to reduce social isolation and it lets the babies socialise and meet each other as well, which is good for their development. <laughs> I've been married into this game for nearly 15 years now, so I've seen quite a lot of what it has to throw at us. And although it's a great way of life, of course it is, but it can be really hard. It can be really frustrating and you're having to move somewhere new, make new friends, understand a new way of life, new house, all these challenges. Um, and I think when there's children involved as well, as a mum and as a dad, you just want to do the best by them. These are the people focusing on making sure that daily life outside of the military bubble thrives. Inside, life in Britain's biggest military training area seems to be working well.